So to share with you something that we have learned about electronic properties of interfaces with hybrid metal halide perovskites and how we can reliably learn something about them. Before I get started, let me acknowledge the people who contributed uh, to the journey that we went through. Uh, in theory, we got support from Leah Koenig and his group. Dieter Neher, Christian Wolf, Martin Stolter, Ford in Potsdam uh, made complementary devices. And at the Helmholtz Center, Eva Unger and Steve Albrecht are long-term collaborators as well, just as are Steve Barlow and Seth Marder. From my groups, uh, most of the work I'm going to show was done by Dong Wen Shin and uh, Feng Shu Zhu, who are very talented postdocs. Now, this is what you might, may find from literature that for one given interface between two materials, you find three different reports that are mutually exclusive in terms of the uh, statement whether you have charge carriers and interfaces and what is the energy level alignment particularly the vacuum level alignment. This is something that you very often find uh, assumed in literature based on individual material properties that were reported earlier. And of course, this is a full neglect of uh, physics and chemistry that can go on. Now, given that you have these three very different reports in literature, which one should you take to relate the interface energy level alignment to the device performance, for instance, of a solar cell? And that is a question that almost nobody asks. Is that then the energy level alignment that you typically determine in the dark, in the ground state of the system, is that reliably to be used to explain the function of a device under illumination like you have in a solar cell? In any case, to understand the energy level alignment, electronic properties of materials and interfaces, the best methods to investigate that is direct and inverse photoelectron spectroscopy that gives you information on the valence electronic structure, the core levels, and the conduction electronic structure. Now, the problem, of course, is we have to apply these methods in a very concerted way so that we know exactly which parameters we can extract from our sample and the material because actually this is not a true ground state measurement because you're illuminating your sample with UV light or X-rays and you're extracting electrons. So holes have to remove to be removed from the sample. So it's not exactly a ground state method. And we already know that for metal halide perovskites in particular, sample handling and sample history is particularly important. But I will come back to that in a second. Just to give you an example on how we have to adopt also data analysis compared to what we have been used from other materials, we have to keep in mind when we do a UPS measurement that we are extracting electrons from the entire brilliant zone and crystalline materials like metal halide perovskites exhibit a certain band dispersion that you can see here, that's the valence band dispersion. So when you're doing angle integrated UPS, or if you have thin film with very uh, randomly oriented grains, you're averaging over the entire band dispersion, meaning that the true valence band onset that is located out here has a very small and low spectral weight. You have to emphasize then that by not plotting your data on the linear scale, as this is typically done, you have to plot them on the logarithmic scale to enhance the visibility of the true valence band onset. This is known for years, but it has not yet transpired the community as such. So this is something to highlight. So in the next few minutes, I'm then going to remind you of a few fundamental electronic properties that almost all semiconductors feature, but particularly also of metal halide perovskites because they are semiconductors and that includes surface gap states and their influence on surface band bending and inducing photovoltage, effect of dipolar adsorbates on the surface and reversible bulk doping by oxygen. Since particularly the methods that we use to understand the electronic properties are surface sensitive, like UPS, XPS, we have to keep in mind that we're not looking at the bulk and we have to critically assess what the bulk versus the surface is. And then we come to the question, how does operando measurements actually work and how can that influence the energy levels of a typical interface that you will find in a solar cell? Let's start with uh, surface states and band bending and so surface photovoltage. So 
we know that the surface of many perovskites, particularly in vacuum, can have surface states or gap states. These are states that exist only at the surface of your sample, could be due to lead zero defects that form very frequently. And these then pin the Fermi level right at the surface at a different energy position with respect to the band edges, uh, uh, at a different position with respect to the bulk. That means when you do a measurement of such a surface, it looks like it is n-type or intrinsic, whereas actually in the bulk it can be p-type. So this can must be carefully taken into account. And it is very simple to check actually whether you have such a presence of surface states that mimic a certain n-type or p-type behavior by shining visible light on your sample that is schematically shown here. You're exciting electron hole pairs, and then electrons can go and fill these surface states, and that leads then to a flattening of the bands, so that what you actually measure here is then more representative of the actual Fermi level position in the bulk. Only problem is this surface photovoltage that you should check for in every UPS or XPS measurement, it's very difficult to actually achieve flat band conditions because the surface photovoltage magnitude, so by how much the surface band bending can be reduced, depends on the logarithm of light intensity, and that can be insanely high. Nonetheless, if you have checked that you do have the presence of lead zero induced surface states and you want to get rid of that, Slight exposure of your sample to oxygen, molecular oxygen, is sufficient to oxidize these lead zero surface defects, and you can then re-establish flat bands and measure representative properties of your perovskites. Still, we know that, of course, then you have lead oxide species at your surface, and their position of the energy levels is not yet known. Whether they're in the gap or not, that still remains to be elucidated. The next thing is, typically you don't have a perovskite as such, you typically have it on a conductive substrate or a metal electrode or some other electrode material. And then we have to keep in mind that a semiconductor can be either intrinsic without doping or it can have various doping levels that go from low to high doping levels. And depending on the doping level, you will have a certain width of the depletion region that you are usually known uh, that you know from Schottky contacts of a semiconductor to a metal that you will have at the interface between the metal and the semiconductor charge transfer. And that then leads to band bending at the interface with the semiconductor. And if you have high doping levels, then this band bending has uh, occurs over a small thickness because the depletion width depends inversely on the carrier density. But if you have an intrinsic semiconductor, you will observe something that looks like flat bands away from the interface. That then in turn means when you have a certain doping level, you will see that the energy levels that you measure depend on the thickness of your perovskite layer. If you have an intrinsic semiconductor, the depletion layer width can be a centimeter or even more, meaning that the Fermi level position that you determine is not yet representative of the bulk. And when we look at the typical thickness of perovskite layers in solar cells, we see that the doping level will play a huge role in the position of the Fermi level. So just doing a measurement with UPS or Kelvin probe to assess whether you have a certain P or N type behavior of material is certainly not enough. You have to do the thickness dependence and also have to induce uh, some uh, use some other methods to assess the majority of the carriers. A next common mistake is to assume that a material, also a perovskite, has an intrinsic and universal ionization energy and electron affinity. That is certainly not true, because all these parameters depend critically on the surface condition. And if you just imagine that you have a surface absorbate that is slightly polar, that could be water, that could be something that slightly interacts even in a physisorptive manner with the perovskite, then you have a surface dipole that can point in either direction, which shifts the work function. So even if the valence band and conduction band positions with respect to the Fermi level are the same, the work function can differ significantly by several hundred milliEV, so that the particular work uh, electron affinity and ionization energy of the perovskite that you investigate and have is fundamentally different. 
So for one material, there is no one intrinsic value. It depends always on the surface termination of your specific sample. And as I said earlier, that can vastly vary. Another issue that now comes to uh, sample handling and the history of your sample as you go through the measurement is, has it seen a lot of oxygen or not? Here we see the behavior of the uh, Fermi level position in the gap of the perovskite as a function of the substrate work function uh, for samples that have been handled in a glove box so without oxygen air exposure. And that shows the behavior of an intrinsic semiconductors because there's a range where you can change the Fermi level position with respect to the substrate work function. If you take the very same samples and just in, for a short time expose them to oxygen, you see it behaves like it's Fermi level pinned or strongly p type And the reason for that is, and that we can follow here when we start from vacuum and then slow, slide for a short time expose the samples to air or pure oxygen, the work function changes significantly and also the Fermi level changes its position in the gap of your semiconductor. If you bring the sample to ultra high vacuum, over the time of a few hours, it com from completely recovers the original state, meaning oxygen diffuses into material, p dopes it, and in vacuum, oxygen diffuses out again and restores the intrinsic condition. So again, just the amount of time you have your sample in air or in ultra-high vacuum where you perform your UPS, XPS measurements can significantly change the electronic behavior of the material under study. So, and that can be many hours. So the first set of conclusions then is there are many various things that can go on. So the valence band onset, of course, from the log scale always has to be checked. The Fermi level movement as a function of electrode work function has to be carefully taken into account and also its doping level and surface band bending, surface states and the surface photovoltage as well as dipolar adsorption. The complication is each of these things can happen and probably they will happen and they will all happen simultaneously, eventually also canceling each other. So one has to take extreme care and uh, make very good protocols when doing experiments to really understand the electronic properties of the material and the interface that you're most uh, interested in. Now let's switch to the operando question, meaning what are the energy levels that we have usually determined when the sample is in dark, only exposed to UV light or X-rays when we do UPS and XPS, how does it change when we illuminate the sample with visible light mimicking the operation of a solar cell? As just like one case I'm going to show, we have this triple cation perovskite and on top we deposit an electron transport layer material HATCN. Now when we do that, we find of course in UPS the typical valence band of the triple cation perovskite. We deposit the electron transport layer, which of course is charge selective. And we see then the emergence of the HOMO level of this molecular material. When we then illuminate our sample with 1.5 sun approximately, we see a huge shift of the energy levels of the electron transport layer. But when we look at the core levels of the buried perovskite, we see barely any change. And that implies that the energy levels of the perovskite didn't change, but the energy levels of the electron transport layer changed by a few hundred milli electron volts under illumination. And we find that the shift of the electron transport layer energy levels depends on the logarithm of the light intensity, telling us that it has something to do that is reminiscent of surface photovoltage. Now the question is, where are the charge carriers that we apparently induce by the light illumination? And that gives rise to the shift of the uh, electron transport energy levels. It, could there just be band bending away from the interface? No. When we do an experiment, when we deposit a sub layer of the electron transport layer and do the same experiment and then look in detail on the energy levels up front in energy, we see that upon illumination, we indeed see a filled or partially filled LUMO level of the electron transport layer. So even the first layer of that electron transport material that is in direct constant with the perovskite shifts its energy levels with respect to the perovskite. 
This has never been seen in any semiconductor heterojunction so far, because of course the prerequisite for that is that you have a physisorptive contact. And this paradigm shift now indeed means that when you determine the energy levels of a perovskite and the charge transport layer in the dark, you find a certain energy level offset that would tell you, well, maybe we have an offset of 0.5 EV. That would be the limit of the open circuit voltage. That when we do the photo emission measurement under light, like the sun or more, we find a significant here 0.7 EV upward shift of the energy levels. So under illumination, the energy level split between the, the valence band and the LUMA level of the transport layer is increased by 700 milli electron volts. And that would imply we have a much higher open circuit voltage in a solar cell. And when we make a solar cell based on this interface, we indeed find an open circuit voltage that is much, much larger than you would have guessed from a measurement in the dark. So these are living interfaces that respond to the illumination quite a bit. And that also means for any device modeling that you may apply, you cannot fix the energy levels right at the interface because they can change significantly. And that is not just the case when you have a charge transport layer on the top of your perovskite. You also found that when you have a charge transport layer at the bottom, of the perovskite, also here the energy levels and the energy level of, so the energy level alignment shifts by several hundred milli electron volts under illumination compared to the dark. So that again means you have to take care of that. And the final complication now comes from the observation that, well, if visible light can induce charge separation and charge accumulation in one partner of that interface, of course, UV light and X-rays that are used to excite the photoelectrons in UPS and XPS can do the same thing. Because as I said, we do have a finite current running through our sample. And here's just a set of measurement where we indeed see that at an interface between a perovskite and a charge selective contact material, that we do find energy level shifts in the same manner as with visible light, depending on the power of our X-ray source or UV source, so that UPS XPH measurements should always not just be done taking into account visible light to check for surface water voltage, but you have to reduce also the intensity of UV light or X-rays that you use for excitation by several orders of magnitude to make sure that you get an idea of the system in the ground state and that you don't measure it in a more or less random excited state. So to sum up that, that is to be considered with great care that operando level realignment at interfaces involving perovskites can occur, whether it's visible light, whether it's UV light or X-ray light. And that means you have to be extremely careful. But it also means compared to a situation in the dark where energy level alignment estimated from individual material parameters, the VOC in a solar cell can go well beyond what you would have estimated. And maybe that is the good news that we don't have to find material pairs which are ideal in energy levels, but under operation of the solar cell, the system finds its optimum conditions anyways. Question still is, how general is this phenomenon? Do we observe interface energy level realignment under operando conditions also between perovskites and other charge selective layers and not only organic ones.